Okay, so now we know the state of the uh, various components. We have like the Cairo, we know the, um, the copyright and license for that and its dependency. So the next step would be, can we combine these? So th that means we need to know how we are using the component. So say that I'm using a component by myself here on my laptop, then uh, like we're not distributing the file, uh, the component that. So basically you're free to do whatever you want. So we're, we're gonna focus on what happens when you're distributing the software. So for example, in this case, it's quite easy. So say we're using, or we're writing as, software or some uh, that we want to release under BSD3 clause. And we are using FFmpeg because it's a great uh, tool. Uh, it's released under lesser GPL. And then we're using a GNU scientific library, which is released on GPL. And you cannot use GPL code in a BSD project since the GPL requires everyone using it also uh, must be under GPL. So this is a non-compliant uh, piece of software. What would you do in this case when you're the developer and you find out this, or I, you come to me and I'm the developer and you tell me this is not compliant. What, what can I do now to resolve this? I've, been in one such case, and uh, the, the next phase then was to investigate how much code you need to change, and it turned out to be one, one line, and, and that, that that was easy. So you just remove this call to uh, this GPL library, and you can oh, choose. Oh, so I, I, I would need to choose a different uh, library, which would be compliant then. That's one option. You could also contact the authors of uh, GSL, or the copyright holders and ask, could I possibly get a permission or could you license this uh, under LGPL for me? Okay, okay. Or you could cool. change the license of Osomo as well. Yeah. Uh, and in the case of changing the license of GSL, it requires that each and every copyright holder agrees to the change of license. So how do we like determine the license compliance? The, it's, it's usually manual work. So you can use a graph, which I'm using quite a lot, but nowadays I know it by hand. Uh, sometimes I have to dig in and read the license text. And basically you, you build up in your, in your spine a knowledge of license compatibility. And we've seen this before. So this is quite useful when you're um, trying to f find the uh, compatibility. So if you, for example, have, uh, what did we have before we wanted to release it under a license that is not here, that was not very, yeah, let's say modify BSD here. You can see there is no way you can go from GPL, like either V3 or V2 to the modified BSD. It means that uh, you can't use it. But if you're having a GPL v2 program, a program released on GPL v2, the modified BSD can follow the arrows and get down to the GPL v2 here. So this is the idea of this graph. We have another graph for us, which is David Wheeler's, which we've seen before. Uh, it's basically the same. And there is another project going on the FOSS license compatibility graph, uh, which I'm currently working on. Uh, the idea with this project is to create uh, a human readable gr um, graph. In this case, you're seeing it because this is kind of human readable and it's also machine readable. So uh, it's in JSON format. So a program, actually one of my programs <laughs> can read the JSON file. So we have, assuming that my Python script to uh, convert the JSON file into this graph is correct, which I, it is. <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, th then we, we like have uh, the same source code, the JSON file that can be used by computer and the same source code is also used to produce this graph 
which is quite useful. But then I'm having a discussion with Mirko, who has been on this podcast before, and we are not sure, and he's sort of winning the arguments. Uh, so we might go for another solution for this uh, graph. Who would be the consumer of such graphs? Why does it need to be human readable? If you're working with compliance or say that you want to um, license your software, so you have a software that uses uh, GPLv2 and it uses Apache 2.0, for example, then such a graph could show you what uh, choices you have of license. Ah, I see. Okay. And so it's a shameless promotion here for one of my tools. Uh, I've talked about it before. It basically takes, for example, the Yocto output in a specific format. So you can specify a component with a, uh, a dependency and the licenses. It's uh, got algebraic, uh, algeb how do you pronounce that? Algebraic <laughs> uh, yes. license expression support. Um, it's released on the GPL3. Bear with us, it's under 0 0.1 version, but it, it's it's already proven useful where I work. But using that, you, you can have something uh, traverse the graph, I guess. So so you enter the graph somewhere and, and your dependency licenses, and it, it will tell you if you can follow the arrows or not. Yeah, in, in short. So uh, this program uses one, one of those graphs we uh, saw earlier. So that means for each and every component, my program like asks, oh, I'm having this license. Can I use that other license? And etc. And it, and I, it does that by traversing the graph. And I guess the graph in reality is much, much, much bigger than what we've seen in the example. Yeah, uh, but I'm being honest here. <laughs> the the graph for the uh, first license compatibility graph uh, that's what you have at the moment. But I'm currently in discussion with. Um, Mattia, uh, down in Slovenia, about uh, adding tons of other licenses. So it might happen in the near future. Okay. And I mean, also the uh, the dependency graph is a lot bigger because if you, for instance, we've discussed Yocto, you you would probably have hundreds of packages in there depending on each other in different ways. Oh uh, yeah. So yeah. the oh, size yeah. of, of that part of the problem is also a lot larger. Yeah, and I might have mentioned this before, but I created a test for, for this tool where I, I made up a, a stupid example component with tons of dependencies and strange like uh, license expression GPLv3 uh, and GPLv2 or mo modified, you know, hefty uh, expressions. And mm -hmm. it turned out it like it took ages for my program to compute this. And it turned out that the uh, license like combination, the possible license combinations went up to half a million. <laughs> and oh. I did, um, <laughs> you know, um, two to the power of something is quite, yeah. everyone who's played chess knows it. And uh, if it goes the exponentially. Right yeah. yeah. So yeah, this can be a complex piece. Another thing we need to do is once we've determined the uh, copyright holders, licenses, etc., uh, and we will verify that the the combination of components and licenses are alike in compliance, then we need to follow the license uh, obligations. It could be attribution. Uh, lots of software have this attribution clause. Not every. Um, basically saying, uh, in in my component, uh, we are using the following free and open source software uh, components, and here are the authors, here are the licenses, blah, blah, blah. In some cases, you need to provide the source code. It could be like with the weak copyleft, such as LGPL, that you have to do it partially. And what does that mean? Uh, with LGPL, you need to disclose the source code um, for the LGPL component. 
but not for your component using LGBR. Uh, for complete like um, like provision of the source code, you, um, in the case of a strong copyleft license such as GPL, so you need to provide the source code for the GPL project and your project using that GPL project. Because basically you are also on the GPL. Here's a couple of uh, initiatives. Uh, the Open Chain project is something we've discussed, but uh, I think this relates a lot with SPDX. So let's see if we can invite, for example, Shane from this project and have a podcast video with him. There's a couple of people who started something like the open source uh, compliance, uh, shaming, whatever group, uh, and go to this website and you can find tons of good links and material about the open source tools. I'm talking about the tools themselves being open source here. So you don't have to rely on proprietary products. And the open source tool here are meant to deal with compliance for open source software. So it's like a made up perspective here. Yeah, so that's what my listeners. URL. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I guess for those listen, following us on as a pod, yeah. we will put all this in this description. So, so you'll have a yeah. bunch of links. Yeah. From this uh, yeah. And here are, so you need to look it up um, in the, uh, on the website, the reuse software, there's a link to that. And reuse was uh, used in this example to uh, apply, but it can also like verify and it can create a bill of material and more stuff. There's a couple of links to tools that can detect license and copyright. There's a couple of links on how you can verify that your components are in compliance. Including the the shameless self promotion, I see. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's killing, killing. Yeah. Well, I suppose so I there aren't that many of those tools about. out there anyway, are there? Excuse me. There aren't that many of those tools out there anyway. I didn't find any, so I decided to write one, and it wasn't that e as easy as I initially thought. <laughs> there there, there <laughs> was no never reason is. why there wasn't any. <laughs> yeah, perhaps. Uh, I I think I've tried like. 12 different approaches to, to it, but now it seems to be working. It's, yeah, that's another story. Uh, okay, again, we provide links to miscellaneous initiatives. We went through them, and there's a couple of more interesting things here. There's a link to SPDX, to Quartermaster, Open Source Review Toolkit, and Mattia, the lawyer down in Slovenia, has written quite a good, no, it's really good, um, blog about how and why to properly write copyright statements in your code. Read that. It's it's good. Thank you very much. Yeah, thanks. Yeah, and, and thanks everyone for listening. Um, as you might know, we're we're both a pod and a YouTube channel at the moment. Uh, we still appreciate likes and subscribes on the YouTube channel to uh, to reach the critical limit of a thousand subscribers. Last time I checked, we were at 486. I was thinking Pentium right away. Uh, <laughs> but we're, we're getting there, and we're, we're thankful for, for everyone helping out there. Also, reach out uh, via... Do we have an email on our website or something? Yeah, we have the info at uh, fos-north.se. Um, so if you have questions or uh, tips and stuff, then please share with us. Yep. Super. See you next week. See ya. Bye. Bye.